Hello, everyone. Great to see you. Seeing lots of familiar names. Many of you have been at attending other festival programs this week. It's so wonderful to see you again. If this is your first Tell It Slant Poetry Festival program of the week, welcome. We're so glad to see you. Just waiting a moment till we reach uh, a stable number. Yes, this is a great time. If you're willing, pop into the chat. Tell us where you're coming from today. We're so glad you're here. Hi, Dr. Jazz. Good to see you again. <laughs> Hello, West Coasters. Hello, India. I'll never get over the joy of the fact that we can meet across the world this way. It's been, that, of all of the silver linings, that's really been my favorite silver lining. I hear you, Tess. I completely agree. It thrills me every time. There's Denmark. Brazil. There's Brazil. There's a fair number of Californians, Tess. Hello, Israel. Oh, great to be with you all. I think we'll go ahead and get started at this point. So I want to welcome you to Staging the Poem, a masterclass with the brilliant Tess Taylor. It's so wonderful to be with you today. This event is a highlight of our 2021 Tell It Slam Poetry Festival. So during today's class, Tess invites us to turn the lens of drama on the poems we read and onto our own drafts. And we'll think about how the theatrical cues of place, voice, and address make a poem legible to us and help a poem to feel spoken and embodied across time. My name is Brooke Steinhauser. I'm with the Emily Dickinson Museum, producers of the Tell It Slant Poetry Festival. And today you all are encouraged to follow along with Tess from home as she first speaks on this concept and then workshops individual poems with this wonderful small group of students that we have with us. Then she'll have time to answer some audience questions and she'll follow up and conclude with a short reading of her own work. You can engage with the workshop today using the chat feature as you're doing now, and you're also encouraged to put any questions that you have for Tess into the Q&A box in your toolbar. We're also joined for this program today by our wonderful live captioner, Amanda. So you do have the option to turn on those closed captions. You can do that from the live caption button in your toolbar. Tess will be working today with three Amherst College seniors who have agreed to share their poem drafts for workshopping with Tess during our class today. And I want to um, just say a very special thank you to those students who are Emma Cape, Annie Martin, and Sophia Bellanova. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Tess. Tess Taylor is the author of five acclaimed collections of poetry. Her chapbook, The Misremembered World, was selected for the Poetry Society of America's inaugural chapbook fellowship. Her second book, Work and Days, was named one of the 10 best books of poetry of 2016 by the New York Times. Last West, her third book, was commissioned by the Museum of Modern Art as part of the Dorothea Lange Words and Pictures and is currently being adapted for the stage by the Poets Theater. Her most recent book, Rift Zone, from Red Hen Press, was hailed as stunning by Naomi Shihab Nye in the New York Times. Her work has appeared in The Atlantic, The Kenyan Review, CNN, and The New York Times, among others. She has received fellowships from McDowell, Headland Center for the Arts, and the International Center for Jefferson Studies. And she served as distinguished Fulbright US scholar at the Seamus Haney Center in Queens University in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and was most recently the Ann Spencer Poet in Residence at Randolph College. Taylor has served on, as the on-air poetry reviewer for NPR's All Things Considered for over a decade. And she is an alumna, proud alumna of Amherst College, which was of course is located about one block from Emily Dickinson's home. Tess lives in El Cerrito, California, where she comes from today. Tess, thank you so much for being with us and welcome. Golly, Brooke, thank you so much. And thank you for that lovely introduction and for the invitation to be here for the bicentennial year of Amherst College. Um, we're kind of thinking about Amherst poets and of course Dickinson being the Amherst poet par excellence. 
Um, and it's really lovely to think of Amherst this time of year, those of you that are there in that kind of season of fruitfulness, as Keats put it, um, the kind of fall sun and people tromping back and forth up the hill to marsh past the Dickinson house to go to the performing arts house and like on their way to Valentine. And um, anyway, it's very close to my heart to, um, to, be, to be with you uh, virtually and also just to, to honor this place, this place that has in its, this valley that's cultivated so many writers over 200 years over its time. Um, and thinking about the role of the college in that a little bit today. Um, I'm gonna do this lecture. The, the, basically, I, let me tell you how we're gonna spend our hour and a half together. I am going to do a lecture called Staging the Poem. And in that lecture, I'll be zooming through 35 pages of poetry rather quickly. So what I encourage you to do is to get the packet from Brooke Steinhauser or from, um, from, from the festival itself so that you can have these 35 pages of poems to check out later or to follow along with. There'll be a screen share so you'll be seeing them alongside. And I'm going to be introducing us rather quickly to some concepts that I think really help us understand how poems become legible to their readers. Now they're not the only concepts that make poems legible to their readers, but they are things that I think are really helpful to us as we begin to draft our poems and when we begin to think about evaluating our poems to look for how might they work better. What could we do next? How could we make them more alive on the page? Um, so I'll start that lecture in just a moment. And interspersed in the lecture will be time for questions and time also for writing prompts. So I hope that you'll get your pen and your trusty notebook ready so that you can be a participant as well. Um, I have these wonderful students from Amherst College when the lecture is done, we'll take a short break and then we'll turn those lenses that we've just introduced from the lecture onto the, um, the drafts that these students have brought. So we have Emma and Annie and Sophia here. They're all Amherst College seniors um, who are participating in the great creative writing program that's growing at Amherst right now. And um, honestly, it makes me so excited and happy to be able to be in dialogue with them and with you. So um, without further ado, I just wanted to start that. I'm going to go um, into a screen share mode. So my face will get tiny. I'll be like a tiny icon and there'll be poems on the screen. And the topic I really wanted to talk about is, <laughs> here it is, good, good, good. The poems stage. So. What I want to invite you to do for a moment is to think about the idea of this extended metaphor of the idea that the poem comes on stage and that you have white space, which is the page, then you have the words, you have lights up and you have compression. Only a very few things can happen and they have to happen fast. And one of those things is you need to be anchored in a world or a speaker or a time. And when that happens, when we're anchored with what is happening on stage very quickly in the poem, the poem lifts off for us. So I'm gonna start with a quote from Frost and a quote from Dickinson. Everything written is as good as it is dramatic. Drama is never dead. So um, what does it mean to be dramatic in writing? What is the goodness of drama that Frost is talking about there? Here's a quote from C.K. Williams. Machado says somewhere that in order to write a poem, you have to invent a poet to write it. You also, I think, have to invent a whole literature to receive it and a community of poets who will have produced that literature. So suddenly he's actually thinking a little bit like a playwright as well. Inventing a poet is in a sense inventing a character and also inventing that community of poets is inventing an audience. How does the poem do that? How does it activate us very quickly into that space? So I thought I'd start, you can see that this is like 39, I mean, it goes on, it's long, a bunch of pages. Um, and I hope that you'll take advantage and download and print it and savor it wherever you are. But I'm gonna start with a poem by C.K. by um, W.S. Merwin from the seventies. Something I've not done. Something I've not done is following me. I haven't done it again and again, so it has many footsteps, like a drumstick that's grown old and never been used. 
In late afternoon, I hear it come closer. At times, it climbs out of a sea onto my shoulders, and I shrug it off, losing one more chance. Every morning, it's drunk up part of my breath for the day and knows which way I'm going. Already, it's not done there. But once more, I say I'll lay hands on it tomorrow and add its footsteps to my heart and its story to my regrets and its silence to my compass. Now, I want to just point out that that final stanza is really a stanza, and it was just the photocopying of moving it between pages that made a gap there. So I want you to see a poem in one, two, three, four, five regular stanzas right here. Oh, sorry, four regular stanzas right here, four stanzas. And I want to think about how this poem has the ability to harness mystery, magic, and known things, and it can anchor them. So we have, at the outset of this poem, two characters, I and something that I've not done. Now notice the characters are, can be kind of goofy characters. One of them can be the self and one of them can be something else entirely. And we have the lights up on a story about this character, something I've not done is following me. That character is so anchored that that something that I've not done, that something is able to do all kinds of funny actions throughout the poem. It can climb out of the sea. It can be like a drumstick, it can drink your breath but it's a known character that's interacting with the eye. We're already in a set relationship. And so when the lights are up on this stage, we're in a small scene or series of scenes between the something and the eye. And they're very well, well, well established really early on by the title, by the first line, we kind of know who we're dealing with in this poem. And so although the poem is magical because there's a magical something that's like a drumstick, we're also anchored. And I, I just think that's part of Merwin's skill there. The other thing that happens in the poem is that we do have a series of scenes that cascade partly delineated by stanza breaks, right? In late afternoon, every morning, but once more I say. So the form of the poem actually manages time by breaking it down into scenes that are visibly legible to us so that the something and the I can have their adventure and time can pass. So even though this is a poem with some very magical elements, the magical elements are very anchored. And I just wanna keep pointing out that, that's what I'm sort of talking about, about the stagecraft of the poem, the choreography of the poem. So let's go into a little bit how some of this can happen. And I wanted to start by thinking about elements of scene. And for those of you out there who want to set the scene for your poem and are thinking about how to set scene quickly, one of the things, one of the places that you can go most wonderfully is to haiku and especially haiku of Basho, but lots of haiku. Um, there's wonderful translations of haiku. Rob, Bob Haas has a wonderful book of haiku translations. But I just wanna stop and look at these scenes. Spider, if you had a voice, what would you sing swaying in the fall wind? It's fall and dusk and no one is walking along the road. The temple bell stops, but the sound keeps coming out of the flowers. It's late fall. I wonder how the man next door lives. One of the things that's beautiful in these three line poems is the fact that we anchor ourselves always in the season, often in the time of day. And usually there's one very precise action. A lot of us were taught that haiku has this kind of realization of being five, seven, five, and then we get really, really intense with the syllabics. But thinking about that Bob Haas book of translations and reading haiku as translated by Bob Haas, one of the things that he pointed out was that these poems really work by anchoring time of day, time of season, one image or action. Time of day, time of season, one image and action. 
it's fall and dusk and no one is walking along the road. There are other haiku that have the wonderful thing where they signal the season by letting you know what plant someone is cooking for dinner. Fall night, early fall night, cooking eggplants, cucumbers, right? Those of you in Amherst will see those are exactly the plants that are coming ripe right now or getting harvested right now, eggplants and cucumbers, the sort of like late early fall gourds that come going. But, but those, you know, using the plant as a way to anchor in time and place. I wanted everybody to just have a chance to digest what I'm saying by trying to write a scene, write a haiku, or even just a few lines. If you're feeling like the term haiku activates this whole syllable counting thing for you, just try to say, look where you are and write a sentence or a couple sentences that have time of day, time of year, and one small thing that happens. Should we all do that for a minute? I'll do it too. Does anyone, um, Emma or um, Annie, will you wave when you feel like you're done? Emma's done. Emma, would you be willing to share? I can't tell. She came and went. Um, Brooke, is, are there any in the chat? Would anybody like to put theirs in the chat? We have one in the chat from Lois Ann. Uh-huh. I can read it aloud. Sure. I, I can't get between screen share in the chat, so I'm gonna just hear them. Great. Early autumn morning leaves dance in the wind. Got another one from Lisa Gibson. It's early afternoon at autumn's first turning. I shrug into my jacket for a walk. Yeah, that'll ground you pretty fast, right? And is there another? Yeah, this is Alicia Dantico. Midday sun shines bright, intensity wanes in fall. Savor the moment. I'll just keep reading them without the names. The silver spotted skipper drinks from the asters that opened today. Oh, that's a very precise image and a very precise plant. And if you know the season of the asters, you would know what season you're in. There's a lot of implication there. How about, um, is there anyone in the, in the, on this, is it among the people that I'm looking at, Annie or Emma, who would be willing to share? I can share. Yeah. Let me pull it up really quick. I'm navigating on my phone here. Um, I wrote, summer sun beats down, boiling me like the eggs that mom makes for breakfast. A slice of home here on the blistered sidewalk. Mm. It does focus really fast to get you into a place and a time and a weather. I wrote early fall, morning fog, a mouse scurries between two fences. So if you're stuck forgetting your scene, you might go to haiku. I just wanted to point that out. That's my first tip. If you're stuck <laughs> forgetting a poem open or thinking what's on stage, what's happening. 
And the more precise you can be about the time and the place, I mean, maybe not saying 12.05 a.m. Wichita, Kansas, but finding a way to suggest very precisely through the plants, through the animals, through the heat, through the slant of light, that can be really, really good too. So making some decisions about what's on stage, scene. The next part that I wanted to talk about was, thank you guys for those, those were great. And I see that there's more in the chat and I'm just gonna keep going because I think there's something like 200 of you in the audience. So we're just gonna, we're just gonna move. I love to teach liberal arts cl classes where there's 12 people and everybody speaks every time, but, but 200 people is a joy as well. And this is delightful. So I wanna come back to this idea that now somebody's on stage and they're gonna talk. Right, and they're going to address something, and that this is this other link to this other idea that I'm going to come up to later in this later in the lecture, which is that poems have occasion, they have a reason they need to be, they have this itchiness, this itchiness to be spoken, right? That there, you know, there's lots of language in the world, and so what is the urgency that turns this into a poem? What is the urgency that makes us this particular voice need to call out? right, this, this act to take place. And part of that is thinking about these, you know, poets who were really dramatists, right, like Shakespeare and John Donne, like living in an era where poets and dramatists kind of were just mingled, where they were really the same people, Christopher Marlowe, they're just breathing, drinking the same water, there's no sense of them working off in their um, different silos. And so there's a notion that the poet is delivering, the poem is delivering a kind of monologue right, that it has this reason to come on. And, and the thing that's interesting about poems is that they also have a quality of delivering strange monologues. They're mo the kind of monologue that couldn't necessarily take place in real life. They couldn't maybe even necessarily take place by putting two characters on stage. Sometimes they could, but often they couldn't. And so Robert Pinsky, who's a wonderful poet and who I totally admire and I advise everybody to spend some time reading, said that the, the condition of the lyric poem is to talk to something that can't necessarily answer the world to come, the dead, the past, an inanimate object. Thinking about the speech act not only as dramatic, but as dramatic and pushed into the form of poetry, partly because it's foreclosed upon many other ways. And maybe that that's partly what generates the urgency of the poem. So that's all very theoretical. Let me talk to you about what I mean in, in, in fact. So here we have a very, very classic and wonderful poem, which I hope everybody just savors at, at some point. And it's really fun also to commit to memory. It's delightful to read out loud. It's very sexy. The Sun Rising by John Donne. Busy old fool, unruly sun, why dust? Thou thus through windows and through curtains call on us, must to thy motions lover's seasons run. Saucy pedantic wretch, go chide late schoolboys and sour apprentices. Go tell court huntsmen that the king will ride, call country ants to harvest offices. Love all alike, no season knows, nor clime, nor hours, days, months, which are the rags of time. Now let's just think about what's been set up there. Man engages in argument with celestial body. Man comes on stage and argues with son. Man tells son that his love affair is so great and so much bigger and so golden that the rules of the son should not apply to him. Why do you come to us? We are already in our special world by the end he's saying. She's all states, all princes I, nothing else is. Princes do but play us compared to this, all honors mimic, all wealth alchemy. Thou, son, art half as happy as we, in that the world's contracted thus. Thine age asks ease, and since thy duties be to warm the world, that's done in warming us. Shine here to us, and thou art everywhere. This bed thy center is, these walls thy sphere. Basically, he's saying, you don't have to go anywhere else. You don't have to move us along. We're in bed. We're good here. Don't you see, son? We're fine without, like, we're fine without time passing. So man on stage having argument with universe. <laughs> man on stage having argument with celestial being. 
And the entire humor and drama and funniness of the of the play, of the poem is generated in this kind of impossible conversation, which is nonetheless very dramatic, right? Attempting to convince the son that he doesn't really need to do his work because we're really actually very fine in bed, thanks, you know. Um, so just, just thinking about the fact that then we have this question of address, which is also linked to the question of occasion, which will come up later. But who, once we, the lights are up on stage, who's speaking? Who are they speaking to and why? And I wanted to, I love the kind of, the, the, by the way, if you're in an English class and you're writing a paper about this question of address, the literary terminology that you'd use for it is apostrophe, right? To some, especially when it's to something that can't respond, that's called apostrophe, which is confusing because then it's also like the grammatical single signal apostrophe E. But in case you wanted to like feel very like you, covered the bases that you had the literary term. You can call it apostrophe. But I'm talking about address here because I really want to think about this vocal craft-like technique of getting your poem out and getting it to kind of sparkle as it reaches to somebody. So here, here's a, like a later one, which is kind of funny because it chimes off of that. A true account of talking to the sun on Fire Island. And here's Frank O'Hara also talking to the sun. The sun woke me this morning loud and clear and said, hey, I've been trying to wake you up for 15 minutes. Don't be so rude. You're this, only the second poet I've ever chosen to speak to personally. I wonder if he says the second because he's kind of calling back to John Donne and having fun with that. Um, I'm not gonna read this whole poem, but it's wonderful. It's delightful, not only because there's this conversation and the sense of address and the sense of conversation between man and son, but because it harks back to the John Donne poem. Um, and here we have again, man addressing celestial object in order to have big argument. Bright star by John Keats. So there he goes and he goes, bright star, were I as steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendor hung aloft the night and watching with eternal loves apart, like, lation, like nature's patient sleepless eremite, the moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution round earth's human shores, or gazing on the new soft fallen mask of snow upon the mountains and the moors. No, yet still steadfast, still unchangeable, pillowed upon my fair love's ripening breast to feel forever its soft fall and swell, awake forever in a sweet unrest, still, still to hear her tender taken breath and so live ever or else swoon to death. Now I wanna stop and point out, man addresses celestial object in order to have big argument. And in fact, the argument starts immediately. Star, I wish I were just like you. And then he immediately backtracks, but not just this way. I don't really wanna be alone or hung aloft or watching like a big a hermit in the sky. I don't wanna be like that. I don't wanna watch moving waters. I don't wanna be far away, but I'd still like to be steadfast and unchangeable. A lot of energy is directed, but it's still all directed directly at the star. We're having an argument that weaves back and forth. I wanna be like you, but not so much, but not in this regard. Uh, and then eventually it sort of unravels because he realizes he can't be far apart. He can't really be unchangeable. And really what he wants to do most is lie around listening to his love breathe. So therefore he has to be mortal. And he unravels the whole conceit of being like the star, but he never does it without, he doesn't, he always is looking at the star. He does it continually addressing the star. So this argument happens with the occasion of the channel of the breath, the channel of the address headed right towards the star, even though the argument unravels the premise that he can be like a star and still lie on his love's breathing breast. Right, of course, he's gonna die of tuberculosis and he's gonna die gasping for breath, right? This is this entire thing of living in breath, living in mortality, which of course poems also live in breath. But for this moment, he's channeled the breath and directed it directly at the star, which is again, an impossible occasion for speech. The lyric is an impossible occasion for speech, the address that's chosen as being one that can't really be fulfilled by a normal conversation. It's not like, honey, could you pass me the jam? Oh, thanks. You did, 
that's something that can be fulfilled, right? I got the jam, it's yummy, strawberry jam, yum, I put it on my toast, done. So thinking about the poem as having this quality of address, but also occasion. This is so fun. And just to go fast through some more, and then I want you in the back of your mind to think, who do you want to address in your poem? Just plant that seed in the back of your mind for your notebook. Who could your poem address? So here's somebody trying to convince his lover it's a, it's to have, you know, to get, to get it on with him. And um, had we but whirled enough in time, this coyness lady were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. Again, the poem gets funny. He talks about their cauliflower love will grow, their vegetable love will grow as, uh, and it, 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 you know, and at my back, I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. It's, this is a fabulous poem, but it rides on the wings of knowing exactly, it rides on the chariot of knowing exactly who is being spoken to and what argument is being teased out. So all of that is set before the lights are up on this poem. That's the engine. Again, similarly, another amazing poet, um, Allen, Allen Ginsberg. We know immediately that Allen Ginsberg is walking through a supermarket in California talking to Walt Whitman. Now, I wanna just point out, when I'm talking about something being dramatic, that's, that's like a, you know, that's like a, a, a comedy sketch, right? That's like the premise for a one act play. Walt Whitman walks through a supermarket talking to Walt Whitman. Now, obviously this is just a poem. It goes on, you know, for four stanzas. It's, so it's not a play exactly, but the entire conception of it, Walt Allen Ginsberg walks through a supermarket in California thinking about Walt Whitman, that's already set up in advance. And so this linking of address and occasion, what thoughts I have to, of you tonight, Walt Whitman, for I walk down side streets under the trees with a headache, self-conscious looking at the full moon. And then he goes shopping for images in the fruit supermarket. I saw you, Walt Whitman, childless, lonely old grubber, poking among the meats in the refrigerator and eyeing the grocery boys. And he gets to see him. Then in the next stanza, look at this, which way are we going, Walt Whitman? The quality of address is there. He's, he's reaching out into this conceit again and again. He's addressing Walt Whitman again and again. And the poem stays absolutely focused on that premise. And by staying focused on that premise, we get to do all of these other things like grubbing for avocados or you know, being inside the solitary streets or stroll, dreaming of the lost America to love, of love past blue automobiles and driveways home to our silent cottage. Oh my God, he picks up Walt Whitman at the grocery store and they walk home to the cottage. Lots can happen once you fix your premise and your address and your dramatic occasion. And once those things are fixed, everything else can get weirder and weirder and weirder. Sometimes the thing that you need to address, um, a lot of times the things that you need to address is imaginary, especially. I've just, I think I've been saying that. It's especially something imaginary. Realize Walt Whitman's already dead. You can't really talk to a star. And here's Timothy Donnelly arguing with his debt. I'm just gonna read this to you really quickly. This is such a great poem. Um, Timothy Donnelly is a fantastic poet who I think threads through Amherst to taught, to, taught there, or teaches the Juniper workshop and definitely hung out with the UMass crowd a lot. Where, I mean, so here it is, to his debt, Timothy Donnelly. Where would I be without you, massive shadow dressed in numbers, when without you there behind me, I wouldn't be myself? What wealth could ever offer loyalty like yours, my measurement, my history, my backdrop against which every coffee and kerplunk when all the giddy whoring around abroad and after the more money money wants is among the first things you prevent? My phantom, my crevasse, my emphatically unfunny hippopotamus. You take my last red scent and drag it down into the muck of you, my sassafras, my Timbuktu, you who put the kibosh on fine dining and home theater dentistry and work my head into a lather, throw my ever beaten back against a mattress of intractable topography and chew. 
Make death with me my sugar boat set loose on caustic indigo, my circumstance dissolving even then. How could solvency hope to come between us when even when I dream I awaken in an unmarked pocket of the earth without you there? There you are, supernaturally redoubling over my shoulder like the living wage I never make, but whose image I will always cling to in the negative, hanged up by the feet among the mineral about me, famished like a bat whose custom it is to make much of my neck. Anyone who's taken a massive student loan may uh, relate to this poem. Um, but I also just want to point out again how the address stays so constant and is the engine which makes the poter, poem motor forward. And that's how you get beautiful Phrases like, you take my last red scent and drag it down into the muck of you, my sassafras, my simbuk to you who put the kibosh. We know that the you is always the debt. We're still addressing the debt. And around it, these wonderful sound play, incredible words like unfunny hippo hippopotamus, you know, um, my, make you know, make death with me my sugar boat set loose on caustic indigo. Now that's utter beautiful sonic almost nonsense but the nonsense is anchored in the address and the address has provided a channel for this poem to lift off this way and that is what i mean by being dramatic that somehow the occasion and the address has given rise to this beautiful set of vowels getting bigger and bigger and more symphonic and that we can parse them and enjoy them and enjoy their music all at once Felt like I couldn't end this section without pointing out um, this beautiful, these beautiful poems that are all about address, American Sonnet from My Past and Future Assassin by Terence Hayes. And those of you that haven't read that book, I think it's one of the most remarkable books of poetry written, I don't know, in the last 50 years. I, I don't even wanna put a, it's just remarkable. It's a remarkable book. The last book of all sonnets that I had read before I read this book was Shakespeare's sonnets. And, all of Shakespeare's sonnets are addressed to the lover and the lover is an ultimately utterly changeable figure. And in Terence's, Terence Hayes's wonderful book, The Assassin is a remarkable and changeable figure. So the assassin is not one thing, but many things. It's American racism. It's the racism we internalize. It's the racism of white boys. It's the racism of white women. It's, it, it, but it changes. It's got this slippery quality of moving across the sonnets. A little bit like you never quite know who Shakespeare's lover really is, or if it's a man or a woman, or you know, what color hair they really have, or what color skin. This feeling, but there is a character that's been created and is being addressed. The, there's a character that's been created that is being addressed called the assassin. And all of the poems for the entire book are addressed to the assassin, even though the assassin, this figurehead keeps changing ever so slightly by the context of the poems, there's a feeling of address and a feeling of the poem, the sonnet talking into this space towards this figure. So I'll just read this one. My mother says I'm beautiful inside and out, but my lover never believed it. My, never, my lover never believed I held her name inside my mouth. My mother calls me her silver bullet, her mercy pill, the metal along her spine. I am my mother's bewildered shadow. My lover's bewildering shadow is mine. I have wept listening to a terrible bewildering music break over and through and break down a black woman's voice. I talk to myself like her sister. Assassin, you are a mystery to me, I say to my reflection sometimes. You are beautiful because of your sadness, but you would be more beautiful be without your fear. Assassin, you are a mystery to me, I say to my reflection sometimes. Now this is the poem in which he's very clear that the assassin also could be himself. But if I, I really, if you're interested in this question, if this topic excites you, um, if you like this poem, um, American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin is just a remarkable book and really, really fun to watch how these concepts play out um, across the book.
So before I move on, what I want everybody to do is just take a second and brainstorm who could you write a poem to? And maybe it could be to your debt. Maybe it could be, maybe, maybe it could be to something that is a little bit unexpected. To a sunset, to a tree, to an ancestor. What is it that you could be in dialogue with? Who do you get to summon in with this magical force of poetry? Who do you get to yell at in this magical force of poetry? What does this amazing form of speech where you're speaking beyond the boundaries of ordinary speech into these kind of Ma these realms of magic, what, how are you going to harness the magic? Who are you going to speak to? So everybody just take a moment and write that down. Brooke, do you see any in the chat? There are some great ones in the chat, Tess. Past and foregone opportunities, to my fears, my annoying dog, to my mother's milk tooth, to the apocalypse, to my knife, that person is a chef. Uh, let's see, my conscience, the rising loaf, my headache, my ambition, my bookshelf, to the bully of my child, falsehoods, to the village that sustains my family, to my IRAs, to two most important choices I've made, bearing my soul to vestiges of my former self, to sisters, to COVID. To COVID. Yeah, I bet a lot of us have a lot of yelling to do there. Yeah. So many good ones. Shall I continue? No, I think that's, I want to keep going because I want to, I, I want to be just the, there's, there's more to cover quickly and I, that I want us to have a chance to work with these lovely students. But I think that I energized people around that conversation, that question, and that's the exciting thing. That's the exciting thing is can we make those choices as we're thinking about our poems? Can we make those choices? That almost sounded like the, like a beautiful list of a, a table of contents of a really interesting book to my bookcase, to my knife, to my, right? This, it, it, there was something very, fabulously interesting about those about those wishes right that were in, encoded in that so along with this question of inventing address there's also the thing where sometimes you just get on, get the person on stage and they speak and even then so they're not addressing busy old fool unruly son now the occasion of the poem busy old fool unruly son is man having an argument with the son but another way that poems can move fast is to just give their occasion over very quickly and to make their occasion alive and strange within the first two lines. It's not the same as address necessarily, but it is kind of the same toolbox. Can we make the occasion for the poem when the person opens their mouth very strange? And the person who really does that amazingly again and again and again is Emily Dickinson. It is really interesting how, how you know, I could not stop for death, so death kindly stopped for me. You're like, okay, I don't know why we're talking, lady, but I'm going to stop for you, too. Like, I don't know why you just interrupted me. And the feeling of that, the whoever started speaking interrupted you so powerfully that you're like, okay, I guess I'm with you now. I could not stop. I mean, you know, you're in line in the grocery store and somebody says this to you. You're at a party and you are taking your cocktail to your friend. You have two, two cocktails in your hands and this lady whispers in. Well, then you're standing. Wait, what? You forget about your cocktail. I could not stop for death, so death kindly stopped for me. I lost a world the other day, has anybody found? God permits industrious angels afternoons to play. What the hell? Where are we? What world is this? I don't know. I don't know exactly, but it's, it's very clear and it's very strange. And somehow the occasion of it is so miraculous that you're interrupted in your speech and you just stop right there. So that's not necessarily address like apostrophe or address like to the assassin, but there is something there about the occasion for speech suddenly announcing itself with incredible clarity and also with enough strangeness that you're like, what? So 
channel Emily Dickinson when thinking about occasion, I think. But that can also work its way through to this, even the simple thing of the relationship between the title and the poem. How does the poem get off on its first footsteps, setting up the occasion for the poem so that the poem becomes legible? Waiting for sleep, I imagine Sita in her youth. This is Karun Kapoor who's right over in um, at Amherst now and is a, is a fellow alum and is running the Creative Writing Center. Um, she hid all day under a tree, in a tree, ate guavas rubbed with salt and pepper, stalked the long-haired cat, begged for rotis, ghee, and sugar. Again, we're anchored right away about the occasion for this poem. In between the title and the first lines, we're ready to go. We're ready to go on this journey. Rachel Nelson is a classmate of mine who I love and I don't, I don't know where she is these days. Rachel, if you're out there, let's find each other, I miss you. Um, Br'er Rabbit in Love. The way your dogs bay, I will make you love me like that. High pitched and harsh with need. In love, I am soft as the dust that fills the foot tracks. I gently gnaw a field of butter lettuce to its bone. We're off in a world of Br'er Rabbit and the character of Br'er Rabbit. And we, the occasion of the poem is very much clarified, especially in that line between, I'm pointing my finger, but you can't see, but looking at the space between the title and the first line, someone is speaking, someone's on stage, the character is very interesting, the occasion is clarified and off we go. I wanna say one more thing. And I think, I think a couple more things. One is that um, it's very useful also to think about the speech of the poem in terms of the way that it's going to affect the body and the way that it infects the body that it, it comes from and the way that it transmits language into the body that receives it. And here we are really back in drama, drama land. And here I'm gonna give you this reading of the beginning of Richard III. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York and all the clouds that lured upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front and now instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I that am not shaped for sportive tricks nor made to court an amorous looking glass. I that am rudely stamped and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton embling nymph. I that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of fair feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, and that so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark me as I halt by them. Why I in this weak peeping time of peace have no delight to pass away the time unless to spy my shadow in the sun and descant on my own deformity and Therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Even before you know that this is a hunchbacked villain, Richard III, who's going to cast his evil over the whole play, it is very hard to read the speech without running out of breath and the feeling of running out of breath, getting you stuck in the back of your back so that you're kind of hawking the words out almost from a position of, inscript of, 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 of pain. And so there's a weird way that the language itself makes you perform this character. It's very hard, for instance, to say, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber without sounding scornful. The vowels themselves prohibit it. He capers name nimbly in a lady's chamber. No, the, it thrusts itself up through your nose and out, out. He capers nimbly in a lady's chamber. You're mocking. There's, it, it's almost no other way to interpret it than mocking because the vowels themselves, the shape of the language force you into the shape of this character. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. 
and sends the frozen, frozen groundswell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. We're off in the conversational. We're off with this character that's really earthy. We're off hefting stones, something there is that doesn't love a wall. The vowels themselves, as well as the syntax, have already created this neighborly vernacular farmer that Frost wants to create. So there's something there that the poet can do to create the voice of the poem. And the voice of the poem is linked to the character of the poem. We talked a little bit about time, managing time through the stanzas, managing time through the shape of the poem. Here at the end of Song of the Wandering Angus by William Butler Yeats, we suddenly have time pass very quickly, though I am old with wandering. He's been wandering for a little while, ch ch chasing a hazel wand and a beautiful girl. But suddenly at the end, shh, stanza break, time passes, I am old. So thinking about that quality of drama as well, that the poem has this beautiful ability to leap forward and lights up 20 years later, lights up 30 years later. There's a Seamus Heaney poem that goes, I lent back 20 years and found my father digging in the potato beds. How can you, can, is that another dramatic force that you can activate? Thinking about what's your stage. Gwendolyn Brooks's wonderful book, um, a street in Bronzeville literally takes the street as the stage and it moves building by building through the stage. We have the kitchenette building, we have the southeast corner, we have the song in the front yard. There's a the book has this entirety, but each of the poems is completing at like it's a, you're moving around a stage set that she's built in poetry. And she invents characters for that stage set. The preacher ruminates behind the sermon. I think it must be lonely to be God. Nobody loves a master, no. Despite the bright hosannas, bright dear lords and bright determined reverence of Sunday eyes. So once you have those things, occasion, address, managing of time, who are the characters? You really have a lot of tools for getting your poems going to depict all kinds of worlds. I would, he can be a strange character. You could be Vermont. This is Dan Chasen, a fellow Amherst alum. Vermont, I was the West once, I was paradise. My beauty ruined me, the old excuse. I'm not reading the whole poem all the time because I wanna point out how the situation itself is so legible that you're off and running. And that this is a trick that I think we can all practice and learn. Sometimes your character could be the reader to the reader Although you were looking for something else in the mirror, you can't avoid them, can you? The wrinkles of sarcasm, the crow's, crow's feet of insomnia. And so it goes on and on to the reader. That's Forrest Gander. And then I thought I would just close this wonderful, this lecture, it's really, really lovely to have you here. And I wanna have time to spend with these remarkable poets in just a moment. With a poem by a wonderful Amherst poet, Ocean Vuong, um, in which the poet creates the poet. And we do that, we're back at that C.K. Williams quote about creating the, creating the poet themselves, the mask of the poet, the poet as this force that needs to speak, right? And, and in this poem, the situation of the poem is the creation of the poet themselves and their hunger to be speaking. So, um, the character that's being created is the character of the poet. Let me read this poem. Essay on craft. Because the butterfly's yellow wing flickering in black mud was a word stranded by its language. Because no one else was coming and I ran out of reason. So I gathered fistfuls of ash dark as ink, hammered them into marrow, into skull thick enough to keep the gentle curse of dreams. Yes, I aimed for mercy, but only came close as building a cage around the heart, shutters over the eyes. Yes, I gave it hands despite knowing that to stretch that clay slab into five blades of light, I would go too far because I too needed a place to hold me. So I dipped my fingers back into the fire, pried open the lower face until the wound widened into a throat 
and every look leaf shook silver with that god awful scream and i was done and it was human i love this poem because it's about creating this mask creating something artificial that can speak and i think i think I think that's what we're looking for in a way. We're thinking about craft as a way of setting up these occasions so that when we push our syllables and our fury and our characters through them, they become something that can transmit and can be heard. Then it was done and I was human. I love that the mask is what becomes human. There's a puzzle there that artists really do need to think about. And so it's a, it's a phenomenally interesting puzzle. Um, but for now, I just wanna thank you so much for coming to this lecture. And I think Brooke, do we, should, should we just take maybe one question and then, and then take a pause so that we can really work with these lovely students on their poems? Sure, yeah. So um, Scott had a question specifically about your, uh, the, the examples you've given around occasion. Um, and he's kind of making, he's wondering if occasion is similar to soliloquy. Um, I think of soliloquy just as a kind of a, a, a speech, like a personal speech. I think what anything could be a soliloquy. I think what I'm talking about about occasion there is the sense that something really weird is happening within the story of the poem and that we've been brought into it and told God permits for some reason. And I think, no, Emily Dickinson has created this character called Emily Dickinson or called like the eye of Emily Dickinson is this very diligently interrupting person who wants to kind of just interrupt you all the time and talk about death or, you know, I'm nobody, who are you? Who is that person that comes up to you and is able to whisper in your ear, I'm nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? How is it that she creates that character and gives that character permission to come up and kind of tap on the, tap on your skull? Which is kind of how the poems enter, isn't it? But she always has a really interesting story to tell. God permits industrious angels afternoons to play. Where are we when we hear this? Are we in line at a supermarket? Like, who is this character who comes up with these strange pronouncements that she's able to offer so convincingly to us? So much so that she feels right next to us. And so much so that this, the story that she's about to tell feels very convincing or the puzzle that she's about to unravel feels very convincing. Maybe one more? So this question um, is less about the lecture you've just given. Um, we could save it for the end, Tess, if you want. Yeah, let's save it for the end. We'll save it for the end. Okay, because it's a good question. I know, I know you'll give a great answer to it, but it's less about what we've just discussed. Um, let's see, Pamela is putting in the chat. Um, oh, this is just a great comment from Pamela. Uh, I wonder, I think she's talking about Dickinson. I wonder if she had poetic conversations with figures because of her limited social interactions. That's really interesting, Pamela. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're, I think we're, we're good for questions for now, Tess. Um, right. So we're happy to, to take that break if you want. Well, why don't we, I feel like I don't, it's an hour and a half is a hard time to be yeah. a captive audience. So why don't we just come back at the five o'clock of whatever hour you're in? So yes. I'm, my class will be 10.05, but you're all over the globe. So you'll be in whatever time zone you're in. But let's take five and let's come back and let's talk about how we can enter the poems that these wonderful Amherst writers have given us through some of the lenses that we've just described. Thank you so much. That sounds great. Thank you, Tess. So we'll see you all back here in five minutes. And... Um, Poets and, and Tess, feel free to turn off your camera if you would like to also have a little break.
Hello, everybody. Sorry, the camera. Okay, there we go. Um, so we're back. And we are um, going to, part of this masterclass is the chance to look at some poems that were submitted by these wonderful Amherst, Amherst so seniors who are here. Um, they'll, they're soon to be Amherst grads. Now, I'm trying to get it so that I was just, can you all see this share? We've got some poems here um, by Emma. And then we have but one by Annie and some by Sophia. And I'm just scrolling by them really fast. Yes, uh, we can see them, Tess. They look good. Thanks. So, so first of all, um, Anna, Annie, Sophia, Emma, can you do me a favor and just quickly tell me one thing you think you might take from the lecture that I gave. Just, just one small thing that might have been useful to you. I can start and just say, um, it really helped me to think I'm, I'm not like a theater brain at all. So it really actually just helped me to even just think about the poem as a stage, which is where like this whole lecture definitely stemmed from. But um, yeah, so that's kind of a big all encompassing thing. But I do think that that thinking about especially this idea of the curtain coming up and a dress and like setting a scene is really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Yeah, I uh, will second what you said as well, Annie, because I too am not like much of a theater brain myself. So really thinking about, you know, setting the scene for a poem, especially when, you know, I'm writing about something that's intimate to me. Um, considering that, especially when I'm trying to then convey that to people who aren't as familiar with whatever situation I'm writing about, but then also just thinking about the various ways in which I can imbue my own work with, uh, you know, various sorts of drama as well and the different um, roles I think that drama can take on. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And I think also like thinking about like the stage and kind of like drama as events localized in space and time sort of like giving poems that kind of like life and energy and sort of figuration within the broader scope of existence is very helpful and interesting um I'm really glad and uh I was also really glad to have a chance to meet these three students earlier um to share some work with them and have them share some work with me um, we agreed that we would look at this work now and it, it isn't necessarily a kind of a workshop in the sense of everybody will say how they feel, but more that we'll see if there's lenses from the lecture that I just gave that can be turned onto these drafts to think about how to go back in there, um, see if they would be helpful ways of kind of bringing these poems further to life. So um, I wanted to start with Emma who's written two poems that have the quality of a dress in them, right? Ode to Teddy and to my mother who she was, who to who my mother was supposed to be. Which by the way, I just wanna say how much I love that title because we all know that sense of having like the lot, like carrying the losses that are in our parents' lives or especially our mother's lives. Um, there's a beautiful essay collection that's edited by a colleague of mine, Michelle Fulgate, um, which is like uh, what things my mother and I don't talk about, essays about mothers and daughters. But we all have that. I thought it was brilliant, a brilliant essay collection because we all have those things we don't talk about with our mothers or we all have the sense of who our mother might have been able to be and wasn't, you know, or it feels very, this feels like, and also this is a very, very dramatic title. Partly because I'm just, I can't make it bold because it's already bold, but I'm going to go like, hooray, hooray. <laughs> um, just because to who my mother was supposed to be is exactly that problem of speaking into something that can't be and writing a letter to somebody that can't receive the letter. So it's, it's, it's a really, really, I just wanted to just give Emma props for a, a premise, for a sense of occasion that really is gonna mystify and also is going to specifically use the tools of poetry, which is to you know, not just ask for jam or what's, what time the bus is coming, 
but to use language to get at something that's really essentially beyond the limits of what language can ordinarily do. So just, this is like a very dramatic premise that we see here. Will you read it to us? Yeah, of course. Would you just mind scrolling yeah. as I <laughs> go on? Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, of course, one second, let me cough really quick. <clears throat> Sorry, everyone. To who my mother was supposed to be. Shanda, she goes by. Shani, a pet name, she says. But only those who think she's inferior call her that, I've noticed. Her husband, her boss, her brother. But she does her best to own it, among other things. Shani traces back to a childhood, trying to create a life that would love her back. Spent on roads red as her, under the watch of Bible Belt bitterness, manifest destiny mothers, a flick in the back from an Austrian grandmother, middle finger strikes the spine. The fly swatter in the fly, straighten up, lazy red skin. If you're gonna walk bent halfway to hell, get down and crawl and scrub the floors while you're at it. Grand Canyon size holes in her hand-me-down clothes or why, not, why she now cannot go without. Handbags Brandon with Louis Vuitton, as much child support as she can get her hands on to support a child she has seen seven times since her bodily eviction but she is living proof you can be a bad mother without being a bad person. I've seen her cry at American Idol. So there's a heart in there somewhere that I do not have the privilege of holding. How can you mother when you never had one yourself? I used to think that I was the guinea pig or maybe not. Maybe I was not trial and error since a trial involves active participation by all parties. And I can't help but wonder if it's because I'm brown like her that she wishes to slap it off me at best, wants nothing to do with me at worst, just like that Austrian grandmother wanted for little Shani. Thank you so much. So we have all of this really rich and painful material in here. The question that I want to ask about, though, is about what would happen if it was really, really organized as that letter. Because right now we say to who my mother was supposed to be, and we set off thinking that we're going to talk to her, but we end up talking beside her. And we have lots to say to her because there's a lot of confusing things that have happened. There's a lot of paradoxes that she embodies, but the, but the speaker is talking next to her when the title promises that they're gonna to talk to her. And this is a really interesting thing. And I'm wondering if we could marshal this material. My, my feedback to you really is gonna to be to marshal that material as, a, as an actual letter to this person. They called you Shani. Your Austrian grandmother beat you. Now you carry Louis Vuitton bags. Now you don't respond to me when I ask for love. All of that material is there, but what happens if it's literally talking? And, but I'm also, also intrigued by this promise of to who you were supposed to be, because there's something there where the title wants us to recuperate some person that's not necessarily your mother, but to something, somebody that's around or behind or, bes like, so first of all, I would say that I want the speaker to address directly. And then the thing that I want them to address is not exactly the mother, but the dream mother or the alternate mother. And to see if you could get those balls up in the air in the line of the poem while getting this same energy of material out. That's, I mean, that's my strategy for you with this poem. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes perfect sense. Good. I want to, will you send it to me? If you rewrite it, will you send it to me? So that we can be in conversation? Yes, absolutely. I would love that. And the same thing goes, and I'm- Thank I, you. I'm going to do two of, two of Emma's because it's both the same feedback, which is now we get to be that real bastard Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt did some good things for 
nature preservation in the country, but he was kind of an <laughs> asshole about, about Native Americans, right? And he said, I hadn't realized that he actually said this out loud in 1898. Like for me, the, the re-education around all of these issues and being like, whoa, this is so bad. But anyway, that is, it's, I don't go so far as to think that only good Indians are dead Indians, but I believe nine out of every 10 are, and I shouldn't like to inquire too closely in the cause of the 10th, right? So we have lots of reasons to need to talk to Teddy Roosevelt, right? Because he is somebody at whom, who leaves us a very perplexing um, legacy and is absolutely right to inspire anger. But if we look at this ode to Teddy, we realize it's not really quite to him yet. It's sort of about him. Am I right about that, Emma? Would you? Yes, that? I would definitely say so. So the boy with ocean. Yeah, of course. Diverts his gaze upward as his father says, they all died from disease when they weren't killing each other. The boy with his oceans for eyes looks back at me. So we have this relation to him and we're, we're angry enough at him to want to write sort of to him, but the poem is actually talking sideways it's narrating outward. And I just want you to take that speaker and turn them directly at. Um, in my first book, The Forage House, I have a very long poem called Letter to Jefferson from Monticello. It took a really long time to write. It's a moment where I just let it rip. One of the things that people told me when I was writing a monologue that's addressing Thomas Jefferson is that I can't get away with telling Thomas Jefferson stuff he knows about himself already. So for instance, I can't be like, you have red hair, you live in Virginia. He's gonna be like, even though I'm dead, I don't care, right? But if I were to tell him all of the pain and suffering that you know he had left to his many black and white descendants and to the country, you know, and to the metaphor that he started, and the, you know, that that if I were able to somehow get in there. So a lot of the letter to Jefferson is telling him what Berkeley, California looks like you know, and how segregated my own childhood was, even in Berkeley, California. And so I think that's another technique about talking to these people is that you, and it's partly a dramatic technique, you can't, you can't tell them stuff that you would know, that they would know, or if you do, you're telling it like, when I heard that you said this, it made me feel this way. But I think, again, we have the stagecraft problem because you're on stage and Teddy is on stage, but you're talking this way. And I really think that you're gonna get more traction if you talk that way. But they're both really good premises for poems. These are both, it's, I mean, again, you, this is the lyric condition to argue with that which you, is not gonna, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt's not gonna give you satisfaction by coming back and being like, sure, I totally see your side, Emma. I get it, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so anyway, that is my advice to Emma. Emma, will you send me them when you've rewritten them? Do you see how- Yes, of course. Do you see how being on stage, thinking about the stage changes it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, with Annie, will you read Book Bug? Mm, yes, I will. <laughs> okay. Can we scroll down a little bit? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> read it, read it. It's, you just have to read it from the inside of your eyelids. Oh, here, here you go, book bug. Um, I found a squish bug in the book you gave me, blotting the A in any. Guts dried, limbs splayed, preserved in perfect symmetry on the paper. You must have stopped halfway down page 209, paused for some kind of digestion. It's the kind of bug that slips through the, through the cracks of the window, catches in the glow of a bedtime book light or, or, or park benches in the Boston mentioned a sentence above its literary grave. Did you close the cover with intention? Bring down the half inch of words with wrath? Or did you simply turn the page unaware of your preservation? The thing about giving a book as a gift, the thing about giving an exact copy you read, I don't know if you ever got around to it. I don't know if you deciphered my marginal scribbles, my underlines, dirt smears, dog ears, and divots. I don't know if you saw the face I saw when I saw the face of the blue-eyed boy. I don't know if you thought of me when you read about the dreams of the woman with a dog and a dead crow, or was it a raven? Mm. That's my poem. <laughs> so here we have a, 
poem, which is so satisfyingly, and you don't need to get rid of it, just I'm seeing it more clearly without your name there. With, it's so satisfyingly inside the architecture of a book. And there's a squished bug inside a book. And then there's somebody outside the book who is off stage somehow or being addressed, but is kind of more distant than the bug. But the bug has this, such a cool, cool um, architecture of being squashed. And I think for me, my favorite line is, catched in the glow of bedtime book light or park benches in the Boston mentioned a sentence above its literary grave. So like the bug dies near, maybe the bug, the bug is mentioned in the book or the bug is around the world in the book that it died near, that there's some kind of symmetry between the bug and the, and then there's this question of reading this marginalia, reading even the death of the bug as a kind of clue into maybe what this other person who shared the book thought. So there's this you. I guess I want, I don't, I, what I'm wondering about, what I really am wondering about, and it's, it's kind of similar to Emma's, is what happens if we take that you away or we put them even further in the background and we actually just talk, we're just there with the bug for a minute. Because I presume that at some point you could get to that you and find, maybe you could find out what they think of you or maybe that relationship will either be good or not good. But there's something to me that's really, really interesting of the relationship with the bug and the text and the, the sort of being lost inside books and there's a part of me that almost wants this, this you takes up, this you is kind of so heavy throughout and yet they're never revealed. We don't really know who they are. They're not a fleshed out character that you, the most active character in this book, I mean, in this poem is the bug. And I just want to stay with the bug. And we could call it, I don't know, we could, who could, the, could we call the you Sam? Sure, Sam can can <laughs> be you. I mean, I don't know who it is. I I do sometimes think that it's lovely when you have a vague you to see it's to try out that the actual person's name, like Emmeline or George or I don't know that it, the you <laughs> does the you have to be a mysterious other you? Now the you that I I feel like I would want in the poem is the bug. The bug. You bug died here in this book Sam gave me. Gut stride, limb blotting the A and any. Gut stride, limb splayed, preserved in perfect symmetry on paper. And I'm just, you died halfway down page 209. Pause for some kind of digestion. Oh, is my screenshot sound effect? <laughs> You're the kind that slips through the clacks in the window, catches in the glow of bedtime book light on park benches in Boston. I feel maybe we can find a way to get back to the you and the marginal scribbles or the blue eyed boy or the dreams. Maybe we can get into a scene where we return the book to Sam or George or whoever the you is. I'm not ruling out that other person being a character, although I want, I want to turn directly to them. And if I'm going to turn directly to them, I'm going to give myself a stage direction. And I'm just showing you what this would look like. So we start with the bug. We're looking at the bug and talking to the bug. And then we turn our head and we give the stage direction that we've turned our head. You dot book bug. 
You died in the book Sam gave me, blotting the A in any, guts dried, limb stayed, preserved in perfect symmetry on paper. You died halfway down page 209. Pause for some kind of digestion. You're the kind that slips through the... Now the poem is an act of strange speech and of strange observation. And this kind of diffuse energy is harnessed in. And then if you want to turn to Sam, and I would suggest probably that the movement of this poem would be bug, Sam, bug again. I feel like the bug is really the star and I feel like the mystery of the sadness of the bug. You could read Death of a Moth by Virginia Woolf too, somewhere in there to think about really watching a bug for a long piece of prose. Have you ever read that essay, Death of a Moth? Yeah, I'm writing my thesis on her. Oh my gosh. <laughs> anyway, stay with the dying bug. Virginia Woolf would also approve of that advice. You're right. Um, Sophia, would you read this to us, Escanaba? Absolutely. Um, would you mind scrolling down a tiny oh, bit? Sorry, sorry, I keep forgetting that I'm the vehicle by which you see it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Escanaba. Escanaba is lumber shortage, is paper mill, is chipper wind and pulp beating against the hands of men. The lake, bring, lake wind brings to town the screams of the incinerator, sickly pastry odor signifying the whirring of machinery, the chorus of employment. Escanaba is sky undoing its restless colors over the police station. It's wake up and police station, a significant landmark full of unprofound meaning. Stop walking at night and police car stops too, unmarked black cradle wanting. It strobes down the street through filthy windows at daybreak. It's back the blue in the homes of the rugged frontier, Trump shrines and dilapidated shacks, Frau Whitmer in smoke shops and mansuaries. Roaring trucks park outside and silhouettes of men stumble about, blotting out various neoliberal notions. Escanaba is boys in the parking lot throwing a pigskin, hoodies against the cold that doesn't give. Man with golden hour drug deals in the laundromat, methamphetamine burnt air seeping through the foliage on autumn evenings. Escanaba glows with the pallid night sky and pacing clouds, moonlight on streets, no lanterns, the biggest of skies and the smallest stars. Escanaba like a pool in the earth, catching those small lights and, and glowing with pallid loneliness. Lake Michigan swallows light and land, leaving shards of ice on concrete shores and thin strips of beaches. Stare into the cold, clear-headed distance. Think how it is to be away from everything you know to be real. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very drawn to the way that this poem is about place and is about very specific things about place and weaves together a lot of um, information about place. And I just wanna be careful about belonging to that place, about what we say, ha, ha, who is speaking and what is their relationship to this place? Because at the end, it's like, think, stare into the cold, clear headed distance, think how hard it is to be away from everything that is real. And there's something there that, is this an instruction to the self? Is this meant to be a universal instruction? And so, so while we're getting this introduction to the place, I just wanna press you on the question of the occasion and also who is there and why and who needs to follow these instructions and what is their relationship to it. So I think for instance here, when we have Trump shines and dilapidated shacks, there's a sense that this person is not of that place. And I wanna be really careful about how, how we act as interpreters for any of these places that we vocalize. And that's partly about how we design the character that shows up in the poem. I wanna just praise this cool thing. Is lumber shortage, is paper mill, is chipper wind and pulp beating against the hands of men? My God, it's a just a beautiful, thoughtful, active sentence that's lifting off. And I almost want to let the title leak into the poem and then to use this form of anaphora, is this, is this, is this. Maybe coming back less to is boys, and then let that fragmentation do some work. 
But I think for you, I want you to think about the character of who is here, why they're here, why are they observing, and what instructions do they give? It's 1030, which has gone so fast. Brooke, I could go, but I don't know how you can go because this is your festival. I have loved being here every minute, and I really hope that you three stay in touch. Um, yes, Brooke. Thank you. Thank you so much to each of these poets. Thank you, Sophia, Annie, and Emma. Um, Tess, I, I think, you know, if, if you have 10 more minutes or even seven more minutes and wanted to answer one question and read one of your poems to take us home, I know folks would love that. Cool. Shall I answer a question? I'd love that. Yeah, I, I wanted to just put this question to you. This came in from an anonymous attendee and I just, I know that Tess, you'll have such great advice for this person. Um, we've been here working with students. We're all we're all students, whether or not we are, um, you know, currently in school. Um, this person says, "Do you have any advice for someone who didn't get accepted into any MFA programs last year?" Oh, that I think my advice is always sort of before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water, and after enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. And that when these things come and there's a delightful moment of success, it certainly feels gratifying, but in all occasions, the work is the same. And I think that for me, the best advice I ever got was from my first poetry professor at Amherst. And he said, read lots, write lots, memorize poems, right? And so, so maybe this is a year that you give yourself to read a bunch of poems. Maybe this is the year that you read Neruda and Merwin and Ivan Boland. And maybe this is a year where you keep a little notebook of what it is that you think that you specifically have to do as a poet. And thinking about that work that Mahatma, that C.K. Williams said of in, I, imagining up the poem, the poet and the audience for the poetry. Who is the poet? Why do they need to speak? Wh what is their audience? And another way to put that is, I think write only those things that only you can write. So that is hard work for all of us. And whether we got into an MFA program or won a big prize this year or not, we all have to think about it. The year that you win the Guggenheim, you'll have to think about it. The year that you get your book published, you'll have to think about it. The year that you're applying again, you'll have to think about it. Write only those things that only you can write. So just hold the faith and stay in the work. That's my answer. Thank you for that, Tess. Do you want to um, hop out of screen share too, just so that sure, folks can absolutely. see you nice and big? And then, um, you know, I'm sure that you have an idea of what poem you would like to leave us with. I'll just mention that you have, you mentioned um, Emmeline and there is at least one person here who would love to hear you read that. An Emmeline poem? The, um, the poem, uh, Emmeline at Six Weeks, is the one that they um, are, have mentioned specifically. Okay, well, you know what, it, it's short, so I'll read two poems, how about that? Perfect. I'll read Emmeline at Six, uh, who? Aw, who touched? Tell you what, I'll read the poem I had in mind, because I wrote it this time last year, when um, after not being able to come to Amherst because of the pandemic, the sky filled with smoke. And um, and because I think it, it, it has, I'm, I'm working on poems right now, unsurprisingly, in some ways that are odes, that are addressed to things or are about small, small moments of praise. And so I'm really thinking about this question of addressing. And I saved this beautiful chat that had all of these incredible things that you're gonna write poems to. And just thinking how collectively that builds on itself to become kind of legible project. Anyway, I've been writing poems to food and particularly food that I grow in my garden. And this I wrote this time last year uh, when the fires were going so strongly in the Bay Area. It'll be in the nation soon, so keep an eye out for it. Green tomatoes in fire season. The smoke is grit in the air when I go pick them. I go despite panic and also because inside I'll make chutney. For an hour or so, I unlatch them. It is late fall, they will not ripen. I admire the firmness of pale green skins even coated in a fine rain of ash. 
Our fire season goes all autumn now, though today's fire is not yet near to us. But the green tomatoes, I love their pale lobes. As I harvest them, I am less afraid. Tonight, God willing, we will fry some with cornmeal and fish. Inside the air purifier whirs, I will boil them with molasses and raisin, jar them for friends and for the winter. Disaster, we say, meaning bad star. These are good green stars. This is also their season. Mask on, I bend and bend to the vine. I bend and salvage what I can. And I'll just close with this one, which is to my daughter when she was just born. And maybe those of you that have had babies um, will recognize this phase. Emmeline at six weeks. You all, thank you for coming. Really, really lovely. Reach out to me if you send me an email through my website, testtaylor.com. I love to write back. I'm, I'm at Tessathon on Twitter and Instagram. Um, I really love to be in conversation and I miss being there in person sharing breath together. So Brooke, thanks for having me. Thanks for letting me celebrate Amherst College in this way. And I'll just close with this poem, Emmeline at six weeks. You howl all vowel. When you babble, your elocution is clear as a downhill stream. With the eyes of a prophet, you gaze beyond us. And when you cry, your wail is tremendous. You stage revolution on behalf of the stars. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tess. I am going to, let's see. Uh, oh, I just am gonna remove all the spotlights. Okay, great. Now, can we all see? Yeah. Gallery review. Great. Thank you so much. What an absolute joy it has been to be working with you today. Uh, thank you to our fearless masterclass student poets. So Emma Cape, Annie Martin, who had to hop off, and Sophia Bellamova. Thank you to all of you for your participation and your wonderful comments and your sharing in the, in the chat. Um, if you started a conversation here and you want to keep it going, you can do that in the messaging channel for this program in our festival event. Um, Tess has uh, also, I, I popped Tess's website once again into the chat. Um, find her there, find out more about her, buy her books. We have more Tell It Slant Poetry Festival events for you. We hope you've checked out the full schedule in our platform. So coming up tonight, we'll be tuning in from the Five College Poetry Slam and Emma Cape will be performing for us tonight. So don't miss that. Um, and of course, you also won't want to miss our headliner night tomorrow uh, with which features Tracy K. Smith and Tiana Clark, who will be reading from Emily Dickinson's bedroom. Kieran Kapoor, whose poem you heard today, will be facilitating that conversation. Um, if you have enjoyed tonight's free program, uh, today's free program, we hope you will consider making a donation in support of our festival. That link is gonna pop up for you in just a second and, and no gift is too small. All gifts are deeply appreciated. Tess Taylor, thank you so much. We hope you'll keep in touch. Hope you'll keep in touch reach out it was so lovely to be um in dialogue with you and really it means a lot to me so um have a wonderful rest of the festival everyone enjoy telling it slant again and again you bet all yeah. right bye-bye everybody take bye. care bye.